What's up and hail to you, Knights of Fulcrum. It is I, your boy Gilbert, here once again to read you part five of Star Wars Republic Commando Hard Contact by Karen Travis. It has been a long time coming. I am so sorry that I'm so slow, but we are finally here and ready to go. First, however, I'm going to go to the comments and start reading a few of them. First off, we got Dr. Crow saying, please keep doing these. Your voice acting of the clones are amazing. You do great impressions. And I hope you do more audiobooks set in the Clone Wars era. Keep up the great work. Well, thank you very much. I will definitely be doing the second one in this series as soon as I'm done with this book. Uh, Matt Curtis says, Shapeshifter species are fascinating. I agree. The Ger they, that's kind of a cool species, the Gerlannans. I don't, I don't think I've ever seen anything like that in Star Wars before. We got that invisible guy saying, Glad to see the next part pop up. The original portrayal of the clone army was way better than Disney rework. No dumb brain chips. A way more realistic portrayal of a human experience in that insane situation. I won't even start on how much cooler Mandalorians are portrayed by the end. Cheers and blaze on, brothers and sisters of the Red Blaze. Well, heck yeah, man. Thank you for your comment. And I kind of agree. I, I'm not, I was never really a fan of the brain chips thing, making them, like, you know, evil. I always just kind of like the idea that they, that, you know, they followed orders and they got PTSD from it. Let's see here. We got Odysseus Mattioli. I probably messed up that name. Let's see. He says, because I have the books all on my bookshelf, when you said he should go do some Order 66 at the beginning... Damn, you gave him the worst kind of PTSD right there. Yep, that was the point. <laughs> nah, I'm just kidding. Let's see, Blue Dodge says, Almost done with Death Troopers, but I wanted to go to the latest video to let you know. I love the channel, and thank you for providing an amazing way to listen to the books I've always wanted to read. Much love, and I'll catch up on this book, I promise. Well, you know, take your time, man. I very much appreciate you just being here. Let's see, we got Expunged in here saying, Hey, Fulcrum, I would love it if you gave Dune a try. Love the videos, keep it up. I've had a couple of people commenting on that, saying that they wanted to have Dune uh, books read. I don't know, I'll see. I'll see if I, if, like, I'll, I'll check out the book and see if, I, if it's something I feel like reading. But, yeah, well, definite maybe. Let's see, we got Qantas Tremor saying, nice voicing, changes from other audiobooks, uh, perfect while relaxing after work. By the way, is hard merchandise coming up? It's sad to see the series unfinished. Yeah, I and I believe that is the third book after uh, Slave Ship and Mandalorian Armor. I believe Harrison is working on that, but he still has to, like, I think he's, he just needs to find the book. But yes, that will be coming eventually. And finally, we have Aaron Benitez saying, I just discovered you guys from the Red Harvest book, and I was thoroughly impressed. Can't wait to hear your other readings. Glad to be a Fulcrum Knight. Well, we are glad to have you. Thanks for being here, and honestly, thanks to all of you. And that is going to do it for, for the comments. There are more, but there's just too many of you guys to, to get through all of them. And I know you guys want to hear the book. So we're going to go ahead and get into that. So without further ado, here is part five of Republic Commando Hard Contact. Chapter, Chapter 10. 10. Notice to Kiluran citizens. Anyone found with Republic personnel on their land will have that property confiscated and will forfeit their freedom. They, their family and anyone employed by them in any capacity will be delivered to the Trandosian representative at Teklit for enslavement. A reward is offered for anyone providing information leading to the capture of Republic personnel or deserters from the former militia or the Separatist armed forces, in particular, Lieutenant Gutenay or Lieutenant Pierre Couven. By order of Major Gez Hokan, Commanding Officer, Teklit Garrison. A thin cold drizzle started falling almost as soon as the sun came up. It felt like Camino. It felt like home, and that was at once both reassuring and unpleasant. The moisture beaded on Dorman's cloak, and he shook it off. Merly wool was full of natural oils that made it feel unpleasantly clammy next to the skin. He longed to get back into the black bodysuit, and not only because of its ballistic properties. Etain was pushing the rear of the cart. Dorman was pulling it, walking between its twin shafts. There were times on the rutted track that she had the worst of it, but, as she kept telling him, Jedi could summon the Force. I could help, he said. I can manage. Her voice sounded like she was straining it through her teeth. If this is the <clears throat> lightweight gear, I'd rather not see the regular variety. I meant I could help with martial skills, if you want to train with your lightsaber. I'd probably end up slicing off something you'd miss later. No, she wasn't what he was expecting at all. They walked on, trying hard to look downtrodden and rural which wasn't so much of a challenge when you were hungry, wet, and tired. The dirt road was deserted. At this time of year, there should have been visible activity at first light. Ahead of them was the first safe house, a single-story hut topped with a mixture of straw thatch and rusting metal plates. I'll knock, 
Etienne said. They'll probably run for their lives if they see you first. Darman took it as a sensible observation, rather than an insult. He pulled his cloak up across his mouth and pushed the cart out of sight behind the hut, looking around slowly and carefully, as if he were casually taking in the countryside. There were no windows in the rear, just a simple door and a well-worn path in the grass, leading to a pit with an interesting aroma and a plank across it. It wasn't an ideal location for an ambush, but he wasn't taking chances. Stopping in the open like this made you vulnerable. He didn't like it at all. He wished he could feign invisibility like Sergeant Scarada, a short, wiry, nondescript little man who could pass completely unnoticed until he decided to stop and fight. And Scarada could fight in a lot of ways that weren't in the training manual. Darman recalled all of them. He pressed his elbow into his side to reassure himself that his rifle was within easy reach. Then he slipped his hand under his cloak and felt for one of the probes in his belt. When he reached the front door again, Etain was still rapping on the doorpost. There was no response. She stood back and seemed to be looking at the door, as if willing it to open. They're gone, she said. I can't sense anyone. Darman straightened up and walked casually toward the rear of the house. Let me check the regular way. He beckoned her to follow. Once around the back, he took a probe and slid the flat sensor strip carefully under the gap beneath the back door. The readout on the section that he was holding said there were no traces of explosive or pathogen. If the place was booby-trapped, it would be very low-tech. It was time for a hands-on check. He pressed on the door with his left hand, rifle in his right. It's empty, Etain whispered. Can you sense a tripwire that'll send a row of metal spikes swinging into you? He asked. Point taken. The door swung slowly open. Nothing. Darman took a remote from his belt and sent it inside, picking up low-light images from the interior. There was no movement. The room appeared clear. He let the door swing back, recalled the remote, and stood with his back to the entrance for one final check around him. I go in. Look again. Then you follow me if you hear me say, in, in, in. Okay? He said, almost under his breath. He didn't meet her eyes. Lights up already, too. As soon as he was inside, he pulled his rifle, stood hard up in the corner, and scanned the room. Clear. So clear, in fact, that last night's meal was still half-eaten on the table. There was a single door that didn't appear to open to the exterior. A cupboard? A closet? Maybe a threat. He trained his rifle on it. In, 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 Darman said. Etain slipped through as he gestured her to the opposite corner, then pointed. Me, that door. You, back door. Etain nodded and drew her lightsaber. He walked up to the closet and tried to raise the latch. But it didn't open. So he took two steps back and put his boot to it. Hard. They didn't build well around here. The door splintered and hung on one rusted hinge. Behind it was a storeroom. It made sense now. In a poor country, you locked away your food supply. They left in a hurry, Darman said. Are you wearing your armored boots? Etain said. I wouldn't be kicking down a door without them. He'd cover them in tightly wound sacking. No boots, no soldier. As true as it ever was. He stepped through the gap into the store and studied the shelves. You're just learning the first step in clearing a house. What's that? Etain reached past him for a metal container marked Gavi Meal. Who's watching the door? Who's watching our gear? Sorry. No problem. I expect it never occurs to you when you have Jedi senses to rely on. There. He hadn't even tried to call her ma'am this time. If we knew why the occupants left in such a hurry, this might have made a decent place to lay up. But we don't. So let's grab some supplies and move on. He took dried fruit and something that looked like cured leathery meat making a mental note to test all of it with the toxic strip in his med pack. It was too kind of the locals to leave all this. There was, of course, every chance that they had fled in terror from the same violence that he had witnessed looking down from his observation point just after he landed. Etain was filling a couple water bottles from a pump outside. I've got a filter for that, Darman said. Are you sure you weren't trained by Nemoidians? You're in enemy territory. She smiled sadly. Not all soldiers wear uniforms. She'd catch on. She had to. The thought that a Jedi might be unable to offer the leadership that he'd been promised was almost unbearable. His emotions didn't have names, but they were feelings that had memories embedded in them. Finishing a 50-kilometer run 32 seconds outside the permitted time, and being made to run it again. Seeing a clone trooper fall on a beachhead landing exercise, weighed down by his pack and drowning, 
while no directing staff paused to help. A commando whose sniping score was only 95%, and whose whole batch disappeared from training and were never seen again. They were all things that made his stomach sink, and each time it did, it never quite regained the same level as before. Are you all right? Itain asked. Is it your leg? My leg's fine now. Thank you, he said. Darwin wanted his trust back, and soon. They resumed their path along the dirt track that was gradually liquefying into mud, the rain at their backs. By the time they got to the next farm, the rain seemed to have set in for the day. Darwin thought of his squad making their way through sodden countryside, perfectly dry in their sealed suits, and he smiled. At least this made it harder for everyone to track them. A woman with a pinched expression, like a Gadan, stared at them from the front step of the farmhouse. It was a grander building than the last one. Not by much, but the walls were stone, and there was a lean-to shelter along one side. Etain walked up to her. Darwin waited, looking, aware of an outdoor refresher to the right that might contain a threat, keeping half an eye on a group of youngsters tinkering with a large machine on rollers. They all looked so different. After some conversation, Etain beckoned him and indicated the lean-to. So far, so good. Darman still didn't plan on relinquishing his ordinance. He reached into the bark for his helmet and detached the comlink, just in case Niner tried to contact him. Are you coming? Itain asked. Just a moment. Darman took a string of AP micromines and trailed them around the front of the house as far as the cable would stretch. He set them to run off a remote signal and set the transmitter section of the detonator in his belt. Itain watched him with an unspoken question, perfectly clear from her expression. In case anyone gets any ideas, Darman said. You've played this game before, Itain said. He certainly had. The first thing he checked when he entered the farmhouse, one hand against his rifle, was where the best observation point might be. It was a perforated air brick that gave him the perfect view of the road. There was a large window in the far wall with a brown sacking sheet tied across it. Reassured, but only slightly, he sat down at the table that dominated the front room. The family that took them in, consisted of the thin, gadan faced woman, her sister, her even thinner husband, and six youngsters, ranging from a small boy clutching a piece of grubby blanket to the nearly full-grown men working outside. They didn't give their names. They didn't want a visit, they said. As if a visit was much more than it seemed. Darman was riveted. These people were humans like him, yet they were all different. But still, they had features that looked similar. Not the same, but similar, to others in the group. They were different sizes and different ages, too. He had seen diversity in training manuals. He knew what different species looked like, but the images always came to mind, with data about weapons carried and where to aim a shot for maximum stopping power. This was the first time in his life that he had been in close contact with diverse humans who were in the majority. To them, perhaps, he looked unique. They all sat around a rough wooden table. Darman tried not to speculate on what the stains of the wood might be. Itain nudged him. They cut up the Merley carcasses here she whispered, and he wondered if she could read his mind. He tested the bread and soup placed in front of him for toxins. Satisfied that it was safe, he dug in. After a while, he was aware that the woman and the small boy were staring at him. When he looked up, the child fled. He doesn't like soldiers much, the woman said. Is the Republic coming to help us? I can't answer that, ma'am, Dorman said. He meant that he would never discuss operational matters. It was an automatic response under interrogation. Never just say yes, never just say no, and give no information except your ID number. Etain answered for him, which was her prerogative as a commander. Do you want the Republic's help? You any better than the Nimis? I like to think so. The table fell silent again. Darman finished the soup. Politics was nothing to do with him. He was more interested in filling up on something that had flavor and texture. If all went according to plan, in a few weeks, he'd be far from here on another mission. And if it didn't, he'd be dead. The future of Kilora was genuinely of no relevance to him. The woman kept refilling his bowl with soup, until he slowed up and eventually couldn't manage any more. It was the first hot food he'd had in days, and he felt good. Little perks like that boosted morale. Etain didn't seem enthusiastic about it. She was moving each chunk cautiously around with her spoon, as if the liquid contained mines. You need to keep your strength up, he said. I know. You can have my bread. Thanks. It was so quiet in the room that Darman could hear the individual rhythm of everyone's chewing, and the faint scraping of utensils against the bowls. He could hear the distant, muffled sounds of Merleys nearby. 
an intermittent gargling noise, but he didn't hear something that Attain suddenly did. She sat bolt upright and turned her head to one side, eyes unfocused. Someone's coming, and it's not Janart. She hissed. Darman flung off his cloak and pulled his rifle. The woman and her relatives jumped up from the table so fast that it tipped despite its weight, sending bowls tumbling to the floor. Etain drew her lightsaber and it shimmered into life. They both watched the entrance. The family scrambled through the back door. The woman paused to grab a large metal bowl and a bag of meal from a sideboard. Darman doused the lamps and peered out through a hole in the air brick. Without his visor, he was completely dependent on his DC for long-distance vision. He couldn't see anything. He held his breath and listened hard. Etain moved toward him, gesturing at the far wall, indicating seven. A whole hand, then two fingers. Where? he whispered. She was marking something on the dirt floor. He watched her finger draw an outline of the four walls, then stab a number of dots outside them, most around the one she'd been pointing to, and one dot near the front door. She put her lips so close to his ear, it made him jump. Six there, one here. It was a breath, barely audible. Darman indicated the far wall and pointed to himself. Etain gestured to the door. Me? He nodded. He gestured one, two, three, quickly with his fingers, and gave her a thumbs up. I'll count to three. She nodded. Whoever was outside hadn't knocked. It didn't bode well. He clipped the grenade attachment to his rifle and aimed at the far side. Etain stood at the door, lightsaber held above her head for a downward stroke. Darman hoped her aggression would triumph over her self-doubt. He gestured with his left hand, rifle balanced in his right. One, one two, two, three. three. He fired one grenade. It smashed through the sack-covered window and blew a hole in the wall just as he fired the second. The blast kicked him backward, and the front door burst open as Etain brought down her lightsaber in a brilliant blue arc. Darman switched his rifle to blast setting and swung his sight on the figure. But it was an Ambarin, and it was dead. Sliced through from clavicle to sternum. Two. Two. Etain said, indicating the window, or at least where it had been seconds earlier. Darman sprang forward across the room, dodging the table and firing as he came to the hole smashed in the wall. When he stumbled through the gap, there were two Trandosians coming towards him with blasters, faces that seemed all scales and lumps, wet mouths gaping. He opened fire. One return shot seared his left shoulder. Then there was nothing but numb silence for a few moments, followed by the gradual awareness that someone was screaming in agony outside. But it wasn't him, and it wasn't Etain. That was all that mattered. He picked his way across the room, conscious of the growing pain in his shoulder. It would have to wait. It's all clear, Etain said. Her voice was shaking. Except for that man. Forget him, Darman said. He couldn't, of course. The soldier was making too much noise. The screams would attract attention. Load up. We're going. Despite Etain's assurance that there were no more waiting outside, Darman edged out the door and kept his back to the wall, all the way around the exterior of the farmhouse. The wounded soldier was an Umbaran. Darman didn't even check how badly hurt he might be before he shot him cleanly in the head. There was nothing else he could do, and the mission came first. He wondered if Jedi could sense droids as well. He'd have to ask Etain later. He'd been told that Jedi could do extraordinary things, but it was one thing to know it, and another entirely to see it in action. It had probably saved their lives. What was that? She asked when he returned to the lean-to. She already had the extra pack slung on her back, and he realized she'd actually moved the micromines even though they were still live. Darman, swallowing anxiety, disabled the detonator and added it to the list of things he needed to teach her. Finishing the job, he said, and pulled on his bodysuit section by section. She looked away. You killed him? Yes. He was lying wounded? I'm not a medic. Oh, Darman. Ma'am, this is war. People try to kill you, you try to kill them first. There are no second chances. Everything else you need to know about warfare is an amplification of that. She was horrified, and he really wished he hadn't upset her. Had they given her a lethal lightsaber and not taught her what it really meant to draw one? I'm sorry. He was in a bad way anyway. Death seemed to shock her. I killed that Umbaran. That's the idea, ma'am. Nicely done, too. She didn't say anything else. She watched him attach the armor plates, and when he finally replaced his helmet, he knew he didn't care how conspicuous he looked in it, because he wasn't going to take it off again in a hurry. He needed that edge. No more safe houses, Darman said. There's no such thing. 
Etienne followed him into the woodland at the back of the house, but she was preoccupied. I've never killed anyone before, she said. You did fine, Darman told her. His shoulder was throbbing, gnawing into his concentration. A clean job. It's still not something I would care to repeat. Jedi are trained to fight, aren't they? Yes, but we never killed anyone in training. Darman shrugged, and it hurt. We did. He hoped she got over it fast. No, it wasn't enjoyable killing. But it had to be done. And killing with lightsaber or blaster was relatively clean. He wondered how she'd handle having to stick a blade into someone and see what ran out. She was a Jedi, and with any luck, she'd never have to. Them or us, he said. You're in pain. Nothing major. I'll use the back to when we reach the RV. I suppose they turned us in. The farmers? Yeah, that's civilians for you. Etain made a non-committal grunt and followed slightly behind him. They moved deeper into the woods, and Darman calculated how many rounds he'd expended. If he kept engaging targets at this rate, he'd be down to his sidearm by nightfall. It's amazing how you can sense people, Darman said. Can you detect droids, too? Not especially. Not especially, she said. Usually just living beings. Maybe I can... A faint whine made Darman turn in time to see a blue bolt of light streaking toward him from behind. It struck a tree a few meters ahead, splitting it like kindling in a puff of vapor. Obviously not, Itain said. It was going to be another long, hard day. A warning siren sounded. Three long blasts, repeated twice. Then the peaceful fields northwest of Imbrani shook with a massive explosion, and terrified Murleys bolted for the cover of the hedgerows. Blasting today, then, Fi said. Lovely day for it. Niner couldn't see anything but droids, industrial droids, moving around the quarry. He ran his glove across his visor to clear the droplets of rain, and tried several binoc magnifications, flicking between settings with eye movements. But if there were organic workers around, he couldn't see any. The quarry was a massive and startling gouge in the landscape, an amphitheater with stepped sides that allowed droid excavators to dig out rock for processing. The depression sloped gently on one side. It was a towering cliff on the other. A small site office with alloy-plated walls and no windows sat beside a wide track at the top of the slope. Apart from the steady procession of droids laden with raw rock for the screening plant, the area was deserted. But someone, something, was controlling the detonations. They had to be in the building, and structures with solid alloy walls like that tended to have interesting contents. The all-clear siren sounded. The droids moved in to scoop up the loose rock, sending spray and mud flying as they rumbled up the slopes. Okay, let's see what we can liberate from the hut, Niner said. Atten, with me. Fi, stay here and cover. They darted out of the trees and across a hundred meters of open land to the edge of the quarry, dodging between giant droids that took no notice of them. One droid, its wheels as high as Niner was tall, swung its bucket scoop unexpectedly and struck his shoulder plate a glancing blow. He stumbled and Atten caught his arm, steadying him. They paused, waiting for the next droid to return up the slope, then jogged alongside it until level with the site building. They were now exposed, pressed close to the front wall. The building was only ten meters wide. Atten knelt to the door and studied the single rock. Pretty insubstantial if this is where they stole the explosives, he said. Let's take a look. Atten stood up slowly and placed a scope on the door to listen for movement. He shook his head at Niner. Then he slid a flimsy thin, flat endoscope around the jab, working it back and forth, slowly and carefully. Now that's a tight fit, he said. Can't get it in. We could always just walk in there. Remember, we're probably heading into a store full of explosives. If I could get a probe through, it could at least get a sniff of the air and test for chemicals. Okay, let's walk in carefully then. There was no handle. Niner stood to the hinge side, DC in one hand, and pressed silently on the single plate that made up the door. It didn't yield. Atten nodded. He took out a handheld ram, ten kilos that seemed like dead, useless weight in their packs until now. He squared it up to the lock. Niner raised up one finger. Three. Two. It applied a force of two metric tons. Go! The door fell open, and they both leapt back as a stream of blaster fire shot out. It stopped suddenly. They squatted on either side of the entrance. Usually this was simple. If someone inside didn't want to leave, a grenade coaxed them out, one way or another. But with the chance of high explosives inside, that method was a little too emphatic. Niner shook his head. Atten moved the endoscope carefully, getting a glimpse of the building's interior. Then he edged the probe into the doorway, 
drawing another stream of blaster fire. Two moving around, he said. Lights out, but the probe got a sniff of explosives. Spot lamp and rush them then? Atten shook his head. He took out a grenade and locked it in the safety position. How nervous would you be if you were sitting on enough stuff to put this quarry into orbit? Drink spillingly nervous, I'd say. Yeah. Atten hefted the grenade a few times. That's what I thought. He bowled the disabled grenade into the doorway and jerked back. Three seconds later, two weak ways rushed out. Niner and Atten fired simultaneously. One weak way dropped instantly, and the other's momentum carried him on a few meters farther, until he fell on the path at the top of the ramp. The quarry droids trundled on, oblivious. If the shot hadn't killed him, the advancing droid did. Sarge, you need some help down there? Niner motioned Atten inside. No fi, we're set here. Keep an eye out in case we get company. The building reeked of cooking and unwashed weak way. A small droid, lights blinking on standby and caked in dried mud, stood by a console. The rest of the space, three rooms, was taken up by explosives, detonators, and various spare parts and stenciled crates. There's your demolitions, man, Atten said, tapping the droid on its head and retrieved his grenade. He wiped it with his glove and put it back in his belt pack. I'd rather have Darman, Niner said. He studied the inert droid, which seemed to be waiting for the dislodged rock to be cleared. It jerked suddenly into life, made its way toward a crate of explosives, opened the safety lid, and took out several tubes. Then it turned toward the room where the detonators were kept. Niner reached out and opened its control panel to deactivate it. Take some time off, friend, he said. Blasting's over for the day. It didn't appear that the weak way had been employed here. The droid sorted all the charges and oversaw the blasting. On an upturned crate were the remains of a meal, eaten off makeshift plates fashioned from box lids. It looked like the weak ways had been hiding out here, and Niner was pretty sure he knew who they were avoiding. Atten checked the various charges and detonators, selecting what appeared to take his fancy and piling it in a clear space on the muddy floor. He was a connoisseur of technology, especially things with complex circuitry. Lovely, he said with genuine satisfaction. Some debts here that you can set off from 50 clicks. That's what we need, a bit of a pyrotechnic show. Can we carry as much as we need? Oh, there's some beauties here. Darman would think they were pretty basic, but they're going to work fine as diversions. Absolute beauts. Atten held up spheres around the size of a scoop ball. Now this baby. <laughs> Something fell to the floor in one of the rooms off the main one. Atten held his rifle on the doorway and Niner drew his sidearm. He was edging towards the door when a sudden voice almost made him squeeze the trigger. Apps my kapuna, the voice said. The voice was shaking, and judging by the accent, it probably belonged to a weak way. Don't kill. I help you. You. Out. Now. Projected from his helmet, Atten's voice was intimidating enough, without a rifle to back it up. A weak way stumbled out from behind a stack of crates and sank to his knees, hands held up. Atten pushed him down flat with his boot. DC aimed at his head. Arms behind your back, and don't even breathe. Got it? The weak way appeared to have got it very quickly. He froze and let Niner cuff his wrists with a length of wire. Niner did a sweep of the rooms again, worried that if they'd missed one target, they might have missed more. But it was clear. He walked back and swatted down by the weak way's head. We don't need a prisoner slowing us down, he said. Give me a good reason why I shouldn't kill you. Please, I know Hokan. I'll bet you know him pretty well if you're hiding out here. What's your name? Gutene. I were right-hand man. Not anymore, though, eh? I know places. Yeah, we know places too. I got key codes. We've got ordnance. I got codes to Techlit Ground Station. You wouldn't be messing around, would you, Gutene? I don't have time for that. How can kill me? You take me with you? You Republic guys, nice. You gentlemen. Niner looked at Adden. He shrugged. He'll slow us down, Sarge. Then we either leave him here or kill him. The conversation wasn't designed to scare Gutene, but it had that effect anyway. It was a genuine problem. Niner was reluctant to drag a prisoner around with him, and there was no guarantee the weak way wouldn't try to buy back favor from Hokan with intelligence on their strength and movements. He was an unwelcome dilemma. Atten clicked his DC, and it started to power up. I'll get you Nimi boss, too. We definitely don't need him. Nimi's really mad at Hokan. He put droids in his nice shiny villa. Floor's messed up. 
Goudinet's breathing rasped in the silence of the room. Niner weighed the extra baggage, against the prospect of some edge in gaining access to Uthon. Where's Uthon now? Still in the villa. Nowhere else to hide. You know a lot about Hokon, don't you? Everything. Goudinet was all submission. Too much. Okay. Niner said. You got a reprieve. Atten waited a couple of seconds before powering down his rifle. He seemed doubtful. Niner couldn't see his expression, but he heard the characteristic slight exhalation that was Atten's silent, Oh, oh terrific. terrific. He'll leave a trail a wart could follow. Ideas? Yeah. Atten leaned over Gutenay, and the weak way turned his head slightly, eyes wide with terror. He seemed more terrified by the helmet than the gun. Where do the droids take the raw rock? Big place. South of Teclet. How far south? Five click, maybe. Atten straightened up and indicated with a pointed finger that he was going outside. Technical solution. White one. His predilection for gadgets was becoming a blessing. Niner was tempted to take back the unkind thoughts he'd had about the man's training sergeant. He followed him outside. Atten jogged along one of the excavation droids, matching its pace before jumping up, scrambling onto its flatbed. The machine rumbled inexorably up the slope, as if nothing was going to divert it from its progress to the screening plant. Then it stopped and swung around, narrowly missing the droid bringing up its rear. It paused a couple of meters from Niner. Atten, kneeling on the flatbed, held up two cables. You can't get it to do tricks, he said. But you can start, steer, and stop it now. Brain bypass, eh? I've seen a few people with those. So we ride into town? How else are we going to move all this explosive? They couldn't pass up the chance. Niner had plans for the charges, places to lay them all around the Abrani countryside. They also had a temptingly neat window of opportunity to take out the ground station at Teklit, and rendering Hokan's troops deaf to what was happening around them would double their chances of pulling off the mission. It meant they could use their own long-range comlings at last. Tell you what, Niner said. I'll take this one to Teklit. You hotwire another, and take fine our friend as far back down the road to Embrani as you can get, with as much as you can carry. He took out his data pad and checked the chart. Lay up here, where Janot suggested. With the droid if you can, without it if you can't. A bulldozer droid on a steady path to the screening plant would attract no attention. It just had to overshoot by a few kilometers. It would be dusk soon, and darkness was their best asset when it came to moving around. Niner hauled Goutenay out of the building. Is the ground station defended in any way? Goutenay had his head lowered, looking up from under his brow, as if blows to the head normally accompanied questions. Just fence, to stop Merleys and thieving. Only farmers around, and they scared anyway. If you're lying to me, I'll see that you get back to Gezhokan alive, okay? Okay. Truth. I swear. Niner summoned five from his cover position, and they loaded two droids. One carried enough explosives to reduce the ground station to powder several times over and the other took everything they could lay their hands on, except for some detonators and explosives to keep the blasting droid busy. There was no point letting the quarry's silence advertise the fact that they had liberated some ordnance. It would spoil the whole surprise. They loaded Goutenay last, bundling him into a huge bucket scoop with his arms still bound. He protested at being stuck on top of spheres of explosives. Don't worry, Atten said dismissively. I've got all the debts here. He bounced a few detonators up and down in his palm. Goudinet flinched. You'll be fine. Janat's quite an asset, Fai said. He took off his helmet to drink from his bottle, and Goudinet made an incoherent noise. She could be right behind us, and we'd never know. I hope they stay on our side. Nina removed his helmet too, and they shared the bottle before handing it to Atten for a last swig. What's that weak way whining about now? Dunno, Atten said and took his helmet off as well. He paused, bottle in hand, and they all stood and stared at Goutenay, loaded in the scoop of the droid-like cargo. His mouth was slightly open, and his eyes were darting from one commando to the next. He was making a slight, uh, 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 sound, as if he was trying to scream but couldn't. It's Atten's face, Fi said. Don't stand there being so ugly, man. You're scaring him. Niner gave the weak way a quick prod with his glove to shut him up. What's the matter? He asked. Haven't you ever seen commandos before? They were here. The break that Gezho Khan had been waiting for had come. A farmer had rushed to notify the authorities that Republic soldiers, one man, one woman, both very young, 
were at a house on the Ambrani Teclet Road. Hokan studied the dripping foliage at the side of the farmhouse. The maze of footsteps in the mud and the crushed stalks were no different from those on any farm, and they were disappearing fast in the rain. Behind the ramshackle collection of sheds and stone walls, the land sloped away to the Bran River. It's a mess in there, sir, Harati said. One wall blown nearly out. All dead. And that was just two enemy commandos. One, Hokan said. One? Only male clones in the front line. The other had to be a Jedi. He turned over the body of an Umbaran with his boot and shook his head. That wound was made by a lightsaber. I know what a lightsaber wound looks like. Two people. I wouldn't even have that information if it hadn't been for informants. Do I have to rely on dung-caked farmers for intelligence? Do I? Do I? He regretted having to shout, but it seemed necessary. Why can't anyone manage to call it in when they make an enemy contact? Think! Use your Dekutla heads, or I'll show you how to recognize a lightsaber wound the hard way. Two droids began lifting the Umbaran's body onto the speeder. Leave that thing where it is. Get after your comrades and find me some enemy. Harati put his hand to the side of his head. Droids have found something else in the house of the road, sir. His expression fell blank as he listened to his comlink. Oh. He turned to Hokan. I think you should see this for yourself, sir. Harati didn't strike him as an officer that would waste his time. They mounted the speeder and worked their way back up the road to another small, dilapidated hovel set among the trees. Hokan followed Harati into the farmhouse, where a couple of droids had illuminated the rooms with spot lamps. For some reason that he would never fathom, the first aspect of the chaos that caught his eye was the soup tureen lying on its side on the filthy floor. It was only when he turned his head that he saw the bodies. Ah! Soldiers used blasters. In a pinch, they would use knives or blunt objects. But he had never known anyone in uniform, not even his ragtag militia, who used teeth. The three adults were ripped and torn, as if a large carnivore had attacked them. All had crush injuries to what was left of their throats. One woman had so little intact tissue in her neck that the head was bent over almost 90 degrees. Hokan found himself staring. There are others outside in the shed, Harati said. Hokan had never considered himself easily disturbed, but this worried him. It was an act by something he didn't recognize and couldn't comprehend. Beyond the scope of a sentient creature's simple revenge. It might have been coincidence. An animal attack on someone who happened to be an informer. Harati studied the bodies. I didn't think killing civilians was the Republic's style. It's not, Hokan said. And commandos wouldn't waste their time on work that wouldn't aid their effort. Well, whoever killed them wasn't motivated by robbery. Harati picked up a large metal bowl from the floor, dusted it off with his glove, and set it on the shelf. This is probably our informer. I wouldn't count on much assistance from now on. Word will get around fast. You're certain there are no blaster wounds? It might have been simple predation. He knew in his gut that it wasn't. But what had done this? Hokan didn't like it at all. He beckoned Harati to follow him and walked out briskly to summon two droids. I want a ring around Imbrani. Pull all the droids back. I'd rather lose Teklit than risk Uthon's project. We could arrange for Dr. Uthon to be evacuated. Moving her and her entourage is going to be slow and conspicuous. We're better off defending a position than moving. I want half the droids blatantly visible at the facility, and the other half around the villa. But discreetly. Understand? There was a rattle of metal in the distance, and Hokan spun around to see droids swarming toward the riverbank. Have they found anything? Harati pressed his hand to his head, listening to the comlink. Two enemies sighted, five clicks west of here, sir. The droids have engaged them. That's more like it. Hokan said. I'd like at least one alive. Preferably both, if the girl is a Jedi. He swung onto the speeder bike and motioned Harati to sit up front and drive. The speeder zipped down the track, heading west as Harati confirmed coordinates with the droid patrol. Hokan hoped the droids could manage an instruction like, take them alive. He needed real troops for this. Actual soldiers who could get into awkward places and see subtle things. He now had just 30 organic officers remaining, and slightly under a hundred droids. 
ideal for a small set-piece battle, but next to useless for countering a commando force spread over terrain with plenty of cover. They'd definitely have to come to him. Just this once, though, he'd humor them and join the pursuit. Chapter 11 Owing to shortages, we regret to inform you that we have been forced to increase the price of our new season's bark. Shortages are due to local difficulties at source. We will, of course, be giving preference to our most favored regular customers. Trade Federation Notice to Wholesalers Darman had taken down quite a few tinnies on Geonosis, and one thing he'd learned was that they were built for conventional infantry combat on nice, flat ground. They weren't so clever on treacherous terrain, or without an organic officer calling the shots. He could see a group of trees a hundred meters away that appeared to be skyline against nothing, and he hoped that meant there might be an escarpment on the other side. Down there, he yelled to Attain, pointing. Come on, and get ready to jump. He'd almost forgotten the pain in his shoulder. He clutched his rifle tight to his chest, and sprinted for the tree line. It took him ten seconds. The land sloped away below, all thorn bushes and muddy soil right down to the river. Broken only by a natural back-sloping terrace that formed a small gully. When he looked back, Etain was right behind him, and he wasn't expecting her to be. Keep going, she panted. Don't keep looking back. The blaster fire of the advancing droids was hitting branches far too close for comfort. When they got to the edge, he simply shoved her. She tried to right herself for a second before falling and rolling down the slope. He launched himself and rolled after her. Darman had the protection of Gatarn armor, but she didn't. When they came to a halt at the bottom of the gully, Etain was minus her outer cloak, and plus a lot of scrapes. But she still had two sections of the E-Web cannon strapped to her share of the pack. She was clinging to them with grim determination. Next time, let me jump, will you? She hissed. I'm not completely helpless. Sorry. He checked his grenades. I'm going to run short of ammo soon. I'm going to have to sacrifice some demolition ordnance. Tell me what you're planning. Bringing down the slope. With them on it. He paid out the line of micromines and scrambled a few meters back to string them horizontally between the trees. Can you dig out some of those ball bangs from the pack, please? Four should do it. What are they? The long red sticks. Custom ordnance. He heard her gasping her way up the slope behind him. When he turned his head, she was gripping a bush with one hand and holding out tubes of explosives in the other. Her fingers were covered in blood. He felt suddenly guilty, but he'd have to worry about that later. Thanks, ma'am he said automatically. He balanced precariously, feeling the strain in his calves, and scrambled from bush to bush. He held each borebang perpendicular to the slope and twisted the end cap. He spaced them at five meter intervals. The cylinder whirred and burrowed deep into the ground. The chinking noise of droids on the move was getting closer, carrying on the still, damp air. Run! Darman hissed. Adrenaline was a wonderful thing to see in action. Etain grabbed her pack and bolted along the gully. Darman followed. Fifty meters. A hundred. Two hundred. He paused to look back and saw one thin metal faceplate peer over the edge. Down! He yelled and squeezed the detonator in his palm. A chunk of Kulora blew apart at approximately 8,000 meters per second. Darman heard it and regretted not seeing it. But his head was shielded by his crossed arms and he was face down in the dirt. It was pure instinct. He should have told Atane to cover her ears. Although, it wouldn't have helped her much. He should have made her run a lot sooner. He should have done a lot of things. Like ignoring Janart, and instead staying on the mission. He hadn't. He'd deal with it. The noise of the blast overloaded his helmet for a few moments. There was a crackling silence. Then sound rushed back in again, and he could feel clods of soil plopping against his back like heavy rain. When he got to his knees and turned around, there was a brand new landscape to be seen. Trees jutted out from a sharp cliff of packed mud at bizarre angles. Some had intact branches, and others were snapped off and splintered. A single metallic leg protruded from the debris. Dirt was crumbling away from the face of the cliff like wet permacrete, and one tree was sliding slowly downward. Darman looked around for Etain. She was a few meters ahead, kneeling back on her heels with her hand on one ear. When he drew closer, he could see a thin trickle of blood running down from the side of her face. Okay? He asked. Etain stared at his mouth. I can't hear you, she said. She nursed her left ear, face contorted with pain. You've blown an eardrum. Take it easy. Stupid. She couldn't hear, and she couldn't see his lips with his helmet on. It was reflex reassurance. 
He was about to look for his back to spray when she looked past him and pointed frantically. He turned. A droid was peering over the edge of the crater. It didn't appear to have seen them. Darman didn't know how many there might be. He debated whether to deploy a remote, then wondered what he'd do if it showed him a hundred more tinnies coming. He wasn't sure where else to run. He estimated he could hold them off for about an hour, then they'd be out of everything, except his vibroblade and a Tane's lightsaber. Then he'd heard a shout. Droids! Report! Darman flattened himself into the side of the slope beside Detain. He could hear the voices, even if she couldn't. She stared up at the cliff and squeezed her eyes shut. For a moment, Darman thought it was plain terror, and he wouldn't have blamed her. He'd blown away half a hillside and still hadn't stopped the droids. He was starting to feel a gnawing emptiness in his gut as well. He concentrated on the voices, trying to guess numbers. Two humans. Two men. They've booby-trapped. Can you see anything? There's nothing else down there. Darman held his breath. No, they're gone. Must have speeders. Droids, form up and return. The metal face pulled back, and the clinking gate faded on the air, along with the whir of a speeder engine. Then, there was silence, broken only by the occasional creak of a splintered tree being pulled slowly apart on its journey down the shattered slope. Darman glanced at Attain. Her eyes were still shut, and she was breathing hard. I didn't think I could do that, she said. Do what? She stared at him. He took off his helmet so she could see his mouth. Do what? Darman mouthed, exaggerating the syllables. Her gaze fixed upon his lips. Influence them. Both of them. Was that some sort of Jedi thought trick? She looked baffled. She obviously wasn't used to lip reading. It's sort of a Jedi thought trick, she said. Darman stifled the urge to laugh. It wasn't funny at all. She'd achieved something he found almost magical. At that point in the crisis, it was the best military option, better than letting loose with all the military ordnance at his disposal, and something even Cal Skarata couldn't do. They were alive. They could move on. Nice job, Commander. Very nicely done. He touched his glove to his forehead and grinned. Let's get ourselves sorted, eh? Darman took out his med pack and removed two sharps of painkiller and the back to spray. He fixed his own shoulder first, jabbing the needle hard into the blue vein in the crook of his left elbow, so that the drug dispersed faster. But it still made his eyes water when he sprayed the blaster burn. Etain watched with grim resignation and swallowed visibly. Come on, Etain, Darman said. Hold still. He aimed the spray like a pistol into her left ear. Darman had no idea the Jedi could curse fluently in Hatties, but he was learning more about them every minute. A lot more. The excavation droid rattled down the road, managing to find every pothole and rut between Embrani and the screening plant. Niner bounced each time, too. Buried in the scoop under a layer of loose rubble, with enough explosives to level everything within a half kilometer, he was... anxious. The detonators were disabled. He kept checking that. Now that night had fallen and the rain had stopped, he could ease himself into a position where he could see ahead. Blue navigation lights picked out the droid's front fender, and an amber hazard light whirled on its canopy, illuminating the trees on either side of the track. It was a lumbering thing that wouldn't get out of anyone's way. Behind it, a convoy of identical droids followed. They were an intimidating procession. Even the tinnies marching toward Niner moved to one side of the road. He picked them out in his night vision visor, although the sound alone identified them. It was the knee joints. Nothing but battle droids marched that regularly, not even clone troopers. There were no voices, not even the occasional command to form single file, or shut it back there. It was all grim, mechanical purpose. Niner closed his fingers around the grips of the DC-17. He really didn't want to engage them. It was going to be hard enough to direct the excavator to the target and get away in one piece, without pausing for skirmishes along the route. Walk, walk on, on, will you? you. Just, Just walk, walk on. on. He didn't want to test the manufacturer's assurance that a few blaster bolts wouldn't set off the charges. He was sprawled on top of them. Proximity mines made you skeptical. There were 50 battle droids in a column heading for Umbrani. If he managed to knock out the ground station, that would be the first message he'd send on his long-range comlink. The chunk, chunk, chunk of feet drew level with him, and he froze. It began to fade behind him. He breathed again. Once the excavator droid was coaxed past its logical destination of the screening plant, 
it would be much more conspicuous. At least the tinnies looked busy. The worst part was having a pretty good idea about what orders they'd been given. Just ten clicks. He was minutes away from the point where the droid would attempt to deliver its load. At that moment, he diverted towards Techlate itself, through the center of the town and into the ground station compound. At least the aerial recce appeared to be right about that. Techlet was a sprawl of storage silos and shipping facilities for getting produce off the planet, and not much else. The worst that the Trade Federation had ever anticipated dealing with was a band of angry farmers. It was going to make his job a good deal easier. Just ahead, the droid's flashing light bounced off a sign pointing left. All, All contractor, contractor traffic. traffic. No, no entry, entry via main, main gate. gate. The excavator knew its way and began slowing for the turn. Niner took Atten's jury-rigged cables and unplugged one strand. Go on. Go on. Go. The droid was almost at the turn, and moving at around 25 clicks now, threatening to veer off. But it carried on past the sign, past the slip road, and on toward Techlet. That's my boy, Niner said. The sweat prickled between his shoulder blades, despite his suit's environmental controls. Couldn't speed up a bit, could you? Maybe that was asking for trouble. When he eased his head clear of the layer of rubble and peered around the side of the scoop, he could see a procession of droids strung out behind him along the curve of the road, neatly line astern like battle cruisers, each flashing orange hazard light with its outline picked out in blue. It was actually pretty, all things considered. Then the nearest droid slowed and peeled off down the slip road, the light show behind Niner fading, then disappearing altogether. He was on his own. He settled back under the rubble, with his head tilted so he could see ahead through a channel in the debris. Techlet had little in the way of street lighting, and there were few people about. As architecture went, this wasn't tasteful, elegant Topoka. It was a service depot, and it looked like one. A couple of Trandosians were sitting under an awning outside a hut, blasters across their laps. They stared at the droid with vague curiosity, but didn't appear to move. Niner was almost past the ribbon of huts, when the thought struck him that a 500-meter blast zone would take out a lot of Techlet, and people with it. Not all of them were separatists. Once, Once you make, make that your concern, concern they'll, they'll always, always have a have weapon, weapon to use against, against you. you. Skirata said they had to get used to it. Achieving your objective sometimes had a high price. A bonded cargo transporter with red security straps sealing its containers crossed in front of him. The droid missed it by two seconds. If the driver was cutting it that close, then they hadn't taken much notice of the machine. So far, so good. And getting better. As the droid pressed on, Niner was checking his escape route. It was a good 200-meter sprint to the nearest cover from any part of the road. It was going to be tight. He had to get the droid to halt right alongside the ground station. If it kept going, the blast would be centered elsewhere. He could set the debts now, slide out of the scoop, and run for it, but that meant observing the droid up to the last second, and that meant he'd probably be too close when it blew. But he was committed now. The ground station had to go. It would put a serious dent in the Separatist defenses for a few critical days, maybe even weeks and that was an edge they needed. Working some rubble aside with his finger, Niner could see the lights of the compound. He flicked to night vision, and the green image showed him flimsy mesh fencing and a waist-high retaining wall. The excavator would roll right over it on its path to the building itself. They'd know he was there all right. He'd left the debts until last. The charges were linked by cord in series, just waiting for the final connection to the three detonators that, in theory, Niner could trigger remotely. He clamped the cords together and shoved them into the aperture of the dead housings, snapping them shut. The explosives were now live. He wasn't just sitting on a bomb, he was sitting in one. The charges, dispersed among the rubble, were up to his neck. He began to ease his legs clear, ready to jump. If he didn't walk away from this, then that was the way it had to be. For a moment, Niner felt a cold spasm in his gut that he recognized from a dozen all-too-real exercises. He was probably going to get killed. He was possibly going to get killed. If anyone thought intensive training wiped out the fear of dying, they were wrong. He was as afraid as he was when live rounds had flown past him for the first time. It never went away. He just learned to live with it, and tried to learn well enough that he could use it to work for him, and get him out of trouble faster. Niner fumbled with the cabling. He steered the droid in a gentle arc so that it was square onto the fence. It wasn't the best course he'd ever steered, but with a 500 meter blast zone, it was going to be good enough. He ducked. The wire mesh loomed in his face at the edge of the scoop then strained and vibrated, tearing up posts with it as the droid pushed through, oblivious. It was nearly at the wall. The building was five meters high. Flat roof, no windows. They didn't seem to like windows here. He heard a single shout, something like, Chuba, and he had to agree. This was going to fire-fetch someone's watch with a lot of reports. 
Niner yanked the cable apart and cut the droid's power. Its momentum carried it on a few more meters, and metal twanged and squealed as the chain-link fence was stretched to the breaking point. The wires finally snapped back like a bowstring under the excavator's wheels. One, one, two, two, three. The droid was at a dead stop, hard against the wall. The blocks were beginning to crack, and gaps were opening between them. He had a sudden vision of finding himself buried in collapsing masonry and unable to move, and a combination of animal panic and a lifetime of training propelled him out of the rubble and over the edge of the scoop. He fell flat from two meters and struggled to right himself. Then there was shouting, and 50 kilo pack or not, he executed the fastest bug out of his career, DC in one hand and the remote deck control in the other. There was one way out, and that was through the gap he'd smashed in the fence. It wasn't covert. A human in an overall was standing open-mouthed in his path, and Niner knocked him flat on his back as he ran full tilt for the hole in the mesh. He had about a minute to put distance between himself and the ground station before he blew the charges. At 20 clicks an hour, that meant he'd be about... Fire effect. Just, Just do, do it. it. Niner was past the first line of trees and into long grass when he dropped and pressed the remote debt in both hands. Teclet was a sudden ball of light. Then the roar of air and the shock wave shook him. He crouched as debris rained down on him, hoping, really hoping, that Katarn armor was all that it was cracked up to be. Gez Hokan was the first to admit that it was taking a lot less to get him irritated lately. He'd waited long enough. He tapped the comlink console impatiently. I asked to be out through to CO Syscom ten minutes ago, Dekut. I realize that, Major. He'll be with you as soon as he's free. Enemy forces have infiltrated, and I need to speak to your commanding officer. Do you understand what we have on Kilura? Could you possibly shift your Dekutla Shebs long enough to find out why this is so vital to the war? Sir, we have Republic troops infiltrating more places than I care to name right now, so... The screen flickered and broke up in noise. Hokan switched to another channel and got the same crackling, shimmering display. His first thought was that someone had disabled the receiver. They were closer than he'd thought, and a lot more daring. He put on his helmet and edged cautiously down the passage to the exterior door. His verpine shatter gun in one hand and a hunting vibroblade in the other. The droid sentry stepped aside to let him pass. On the roof, the comm relay was intact. Hokan took out his personal comm link and called Harati. All Hokan could hear was the chatter of static. It struck him that the Republic troops might well have done what he would have done, faced with the same target. Droid, can you make contact with your fellows? Affirmative, sir. The droids had their own comlink system. They could communicate instantly on any battlefield. What they didn't need was the main relay at Teclet in order to do it. Can you contact Lieutenant Harati? The droid paused for a few moments. I have him, sir. Ask him if he has any news on Teclet. Pause. A much longer pause. Large explosion seen in the direction of Teclet, sir. It's, it's what, what I'd, I'd do if I was preparing an assault. an assault. Hokan thought. I'd, I'd render my, my enemies, enemies blind, blind and, and deaf. Death. There was nothing he could do on the ground to deal with an invasion, if one was coming. There was a Republic assault ship in Kilura space, and that didn't bode well. He had two options for his immediate task. He could defend Uthon's project, the technical knowledge invested in her and her staff, and the nanovirus itself. Or, if he was overrun, he could prevent it falling into enemy hands to be studied and neutralized. It was a big planet. If he had to run, they'd have to find him. In the meantime, he'd sit tight and wait for them to come. Tell Harati I want every functioning droid back here, now. Hokan said. We're digging in. And that is going to do it for us, guys, for part five of Republic Commando Hard Contact. Thank you guys so much for listening and or watching if you still are. Please make sure to like, subscribe, and comment below so that way I can read your comments on the next video. And make sure you hit that bell notification so you know when all of our videos come out. If you like our audiobooks, we have so many others. We have Red Harvest, Death Troopers, we have The Mandalorian Armor, Slave Ship, and we have a couple of Batman and Resident Evil books as well. But until next time, I have been Gilbert, this has been Fulcrum Entertainment, and as always, we are all Fulcrum. Thanks everybody, have a good one.